Hi, I'm Tina Halfpenny. I am the Division Director for the Department of Energy Resources for Energy Efficiency. Um, we are the State Energy Office on Energy Policy. And I'm going to try to make this quick. I have a lot of slides, but what I want to do is really um, put some context behind all of this that's going on, at least at the state level, for some of the things that we're doing to create a framework to really catalyze the implementation of the policies that we put in place so that this kind of building can happen in Massachusetts and this kind of building can grow to a scale so we are affecting our built environment in a very meaningful way. A couple of policies were passed when Governor Deval Patrick took office um, that really changed the paradigm of what we do with energy in Massachusetts. The Green Communities Act, whoops, it's not up here. Um, Green Communities Act and the Global Warming Solutions Act. Green Communities Act mandates all cost effective energy efficiency. It's put things together like green communities. I know that Lexington is a green community and a solarized community. Um, and the Global Warming Solutions Act is um, still the most aggressive climate policy that this country has seen. We have a 25% target of emissions reductions by 2020. We have an 80% target by 2050. We are actually looking at that 2050 target. There is no way we are going to get there unless we completely decarbonize the grid. And all of our transportation um, is also decarbonized or is fuel neutral. So we have a long way to go, but um, we have an awful lot of things in place that are helping to make this happen. So in terms of energy efficiency, we've really created energy efficiency as our first fuel in Massachusetts. We have invested, uh, or we will have invested $4 billion through 2015 in energy efficiency and specifically through the Mass Save program. That does not include the money that goes to green communities. It doesn't include the money that we have invested in growing our renewable community. Um, Massachusetts has been ranked number one for the last three years by the American Council on an Energy Efficient Economy. And this is a very significant award for the Patrick administration. They take it very seriously. It actually comes to me as one of my performance goals on an annual basis. Um, and I know that he does not want to lose that, at least in his last year in office. We are also the, um, we have the fourth largest number of buildings that are LEED accredited in the country. Um, so we are, we are taking this very seriously. Um, just to show you, this is kind of my slide on the proof is in the pudding. The independent system operator who manages the electric grid for all of the six New England states has recently started to take energy efficiency activities into consideration when they're doing their system planning. So the capacity planning that they're looking at for the next 20 years is now taking into consideration what our states are doing for energy efficiency. That means we're offsetting capacity planning um, that they're doing through 2000 and at least 24 at this point. So what these two graphs show, one is regular energy demand, the other is summer peak. So you hear when we have those July weeks where we're at 100 degrees, you hear you know that they're asking you to turn down your temperatures on your air conditioner and to use less and particularly during that time of like 4 p.m. to 7 p.m. to really watch what you're using for your energy use. That's called summer peak. The reason why summer peak is so critical to us is because all of those peaker plants that generally are, are uh, fueled by coal, that's when they turn on. So not only do we have hot and sticky days, but that's when we're burning coal. Um, so these blue lines are really the business as usual planning um, scenarios. The lines below them, blue is um, regular demand, and then on the right is the summer peak. The lines below them show the new planning scenarios taking into consideration what these states are doing with energy efficiency. And Massachusetts is the largest energy consumer in the ISO region. These slides are specific to Massachusetts energy uh, demand. So this is what I like to really show as far as this is really making a difference. Um, we have done an awful lot in terms of doing energy audits in homes, um, changing out 
all of the lighting systems that we can, subsidizing the more efficient appliances where we can, um, you know, looking at newer technologies, working with codes. Lexington is a stretch code community. Um, what are some of the other things? There's a, there's a lot, we're looking at labeling tools to see how much labeling can actually be a driver for that very hard to uh, deal with behavior change and you know actual um, physical changes in the building. Um, what we are doing now, because we recognize that there does need to be a bridge to getting to zero net energy building, we are releasing a $3 million grant program. Um, we've got up to $10,000 per unit going to the residential sector. I think it's a total of $400,000 if it's a multifamily building, and then up to $500,000 for the commercial sector. I've got some notes in here. Um, the grants may include feasibility studies because as we heard from Dan and Ellen, it is very important to get the design right before you go in. And that means getting the client on board, getting the architect on board, getting the engineer on board, and really looking at all of the different scenarios that you can build a building to make sure that it is zero energy. Um, so on the commercial side, we're looking at up to uh, $30,000 for feasibility studies, $50,000 for integrated design services, and then $500,000 to help with construction costs. We are hoping that this is a short-term program to really kickstart projects that are out there, projects that are under review, projects that are under planning, and get them into zero net energy mode. What we're hoping is that we can take the results from this kind of program and turn it into a more sustainable policy for the Commonwealth so that we're learning what are the needs, what are the barriers, what are the hurdles that we can address through policy and through some of the policy tools that we have to be able to deal with these on a much longer term and a broader spectrum. So this is a big um, program. We were hoping to announce it yesterday. I'm suspecting that it will, will be out at least by Wednesday of next week. Um, but uh, this will be on the DOER website, all of the specifics on this. So anyone, residential, commercial, municipal, who has a project, um, please take this into consideration because we really did design this to cover the incremental costs of both construction and design. So that is one thing. Green communities, I just wanted to touch about this. I know everyone here um, either is from Lexington, who's a, a really commendable green community, or another green community. But what, what green, the green community program and the green communities have demonstrated to us is that really this doesn't work unless you have individual involvement, unless you have community support. And this is what we've seen. We've got nearly 50% of our state's population living in a green community. This means that they've adopted the stretch code. This means that they have committed to or have already achieved 20% of their energy savings through um, their, their municipal buildings. And they're coming to the Green Communities Division with new ideas of how they can really advance this work, working with uh, some of the state's grant-funded opportunities. Um, Leading by example, this is, this is Governor Patrick's executive order. This is just a demonstration of how committed he is. He has said, if we're going to ask this of the cities and towns, then we are going to do it ourselves. So we have 80 million square feet of state-owned building that we're trying to achieve 35% emissions reductions goals by 2020. It's, a, it's an incredibly challenging goal that we have set forth. But DCAM, the Division of Capital Asset Management and Maintenance, is instituted a accelerated energy program. It's 700 state sites in 700 days that they are retrofitting. So they have the support um, and we are trying to do this. So I just want to give you an indication of what has happened since the Patrick administration has been in place and what has occurred because, I shouldn't say because of these policies, but because there is an infrastructure to help stimulate this kind of work. This graph just shows you what we've been able to accomplish in terms of solar installations since 2000 and since 2008, 2010. There's an awful lot of funding that goes into solar installations. There's also an awful lot of work that goes into training people who can do this. Similarly, wind growth in Massachusetts. 
And these numbers on the end are the cumulative uh, energy, energy um, capacity that's been built up. And then CHP. So we're up to 75 megawatts of CHP. What's really exciting about this is that this is a very short amount of time that we've been able to accomplish this. And we really don't see um, significant limitations for growing this more. What we recognize at this point is that we are a national leader with what we're doing. And we are, um, we are setting up best practices for other states to be able to look at how to do this um, so we are very invested in trying to figure out what are some of the innovations that we can employ to do more. We don't want to hit the ceiling. So in terms of climate, the climate goals are, um, are incredibly important to us. Again, I said the 25% emissions reductions by 2020. We have a pretty good feeling we'll be able to get there. 80% um, by 2050, there's an awful lot that needs to happen, even, even to get us to a midway point in 2030. And honestly, what we're doing now is going to affect 2020. What we're doing next year and the year after that is going to affect 2030. So all of this planning is starting to happen now because it takes a long time to make these changes, to get the political will to support these kinds of changes, and to, again, build that infrastructure that can deliver these kinds of changes. Why buildings are so important to us, that dark blue part of the pie chart. So this whole pie chart represents the 25% emissions reductions. That 35, 36% of the pie chart comes from buildings. So it is critical that we are, we are going into as many buildings as we can, residential and commercial, and retrofitting them to as much as we can with as deep as savings as we can get. And then finally, Energy resiliency. We have a $40 million grant program that also will be released um, soon to cities and towns to aid them in their um, planning efforts and some of their infrastructure building to deal with resiliency. So I went over by two minutes, but there's a lot of ground to cover. So thank you.